Good morning and a uh, warm welcome to the 20th meeting of the Education Skills Committee in 2019. Uh, can I remind everyone present to turn mobile phones and other devices to silent for the duration of the meeting. We have received apologies from Tavish Scott this morning. Um, our first agenda item uh, is a decision on whether to take consideration of a draft report on subject choices at pr in private at future meetings. Are the uh, committee com content to do that? Yeah. Thank you. Agenda item two is a decision on whether to take consideration of the work programme on the 26th of June in private. Are the committee content to do that? Great. Next two agenda items are to do with subordinate legislation or one agenda item, two, two uh, pieces of subordinate legislation. First piece is in was to consider is the Education Scotland Act 1980 Modification Regulations 2019 SSI 2019 stroke 179. Uh, the details of the instrument are provided in paper one. Do the committee have any comments on this instrument? Thank you. The second piece of subordinate legislation is the committee to consider is the Aberdeen University Scotland Order of Council 2019 SSI 2019 stroke 163. Uh, the details of this instrument were provided in paper two of the committee papers. Do members have any comments on this instrument? Uh, thank you very much. That completes agenda item three. Um, as we move to agenda item four, could I please uh, declare an interest in that I am the vice chair of CERC and also a member of the British Computer Society. Um, our next item of business is the evidence session in the STEM and early years education inquiry. Can I thank all of those who have helped arrange the primary education conference last week. This included organising really insightful visit for members of the committee to inform and would like to um, thank the Primary Science Teaching Trust um, for that opportunity. Um, and um, we're th thoroughly engaged with the young people and the teachers we met at the course of the children's conference and um, at the awards ceremony on Thursday night very inspiring to see the brilliant work being done by teachers across the whole of the UK. Uh, this morning I would like to welcome to committee uh, Shona Birrell who's a teacher in Rathwell Primary School, Lorna Hay who's a teacher in Chuka Primary School, I hope I got that right, uh, Alistair McGregor the Chief Executive Officer of the Scottish Schools Education Research Centre, CERC, and Dr. Karen Petrie, Associated Dean of, for Learning and Teaching in Science and Engineering at the University of Dundee, and today representing the British Computer Society. And finally, Professor Leslie Yellowlees, Chair of the Learned Societies Group on the Scottish STEM Education. If the panel would like to... Um, take part or answer any of the questions. It's a big panel, so if you don't feel you need to contribute to every question, it would be very helpful um, if you could um, uh, not not answer for the sake of it. If you've got something, of course, if you've got something insightful to say, we'd be delighted to hear it. And I'd like to start by um, asking the members just to, to lay out a little bit about their experience and, and um, their experience in, in the area of the same inquiry. And I'll, I'll maybe start with... Um, uh, Dr. Petrie. Thanks. So I am a computing lecturer when I'm not being Associate Dean for Learning and Teaching. I do quite a lot of work with local primary schools and primary schools throughout Scotland, in particular helping them deliver the computing science part of the education and also the digital skills part of, part of the education remit, and have helped organise a number of events to help for CPD for teachers in that context. So before I came here today, I asked a lot of the local schools I work with, what's the one thing you'd like me to bring to this inquiry? And I thought I'd start there. And the, the main thing that's come back, which quite surprised me, was the thing that would help them the most to deliver the curriculum is a working internet connection. And it was really, it surprised <laughs> me that that was the one thing, but from four separate schools now, I've had, and, and had some tweets this morning as well, saying that that's the biggest barrier. And on any given day, they can't trust it to be there. And it's very difficult to use a lot of digital skills and a lot of the technology teaching, which is online, as I'm sure you know, if you don't have a working internet connection. So I thought I'd start there. Thank you. And 
Was that geographically based, or was it all of those schools are all in, of the schools in, in Dundee? But we we were talking about it earlier and mm -hmm. realising it's more widespread than that. And it wasn't just because there was a rural, rural element to the Wi-Fi connections. I no, think. I mean one of the schools is Central Dundee, so you wouldn't expect it to have internet issues. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, can I invite Mr. Uh, McGregor? Yeah, so I'm Alistair McGregor. I'm the Chief Executive Officer at CERC. Uh, I've been in post for um, just over a year and a half. Um, and during that period of time, the organisation has gone through a significant amount of um, organisational change, um, but also some, some diversification as well. And, and part of that diversification is to, to broaden our offering to include early years practitioners and now also childminders. Um, CERC is an organisation uh, has got three core functions supporting STEM education across um, early years practitioners, primary schools, secondary school teachers and also school technicians. First one is career long professional learning, which our unique selling point is our professional learning, whether it's a twilight session, half day session, full day session, is practical, hands on, experiential, backed up by the appropriate level of, of, of pedagogy to support that. Our second function is that of health and safety, um, and that's supporting the education community in Scotland. Health and safety can sometimes appear to be quite bureaucratic and, and may actually be part of a reason why practical STEM based activities aren't undertaken in the classroom. We provide common sense advice to the teaching profession uh, in Scotland to make sure that that, is, that doesn't become a barrier. And then thirdly, in, in relation to, to inspiration, we have responsibility for wider STEM engagement projects, such as responsibility for the STEM ambassador programme in Scotland, teacher placements in Scotland, and also the young STEM leader programme as well. And all of these, we will have interactions with early use practitioners. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Yellow, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I, I'm here representing the Learned Societies Group uh, at the Royal Society, based at the Royal Society of Edinburgh. I chair that group. The group was set up in 2012 to bring together learned societies to uh, agree um, common ways forward, suggestions, working together in order to form a portal for Scottish Government, um, for different groups, for the... the GTCS, lots of different groups to, to come and work through us uh, together. I'm going to read off the seven learned societies, else I'll miss one out and then I'll not be at all popular. Uh, so uh, the learned societies group comprises the Association for Science Education, uh, the British Computing Society, the Edinburgh Mathematical Society, the Institute of Physics, the Royal Society of Biology, the Royal Society of Chemistry, the Royal Society of Edinburgh and the Scottish Mathematical Society. So you can see we cover most of the STEM subjects. Um, I should also say, having read the report of what, uh, your last meeting, I would just like to say that I was chair of the Tapping All Our Talents report as well. So if you want to ask me anything on that, I'm very happy to do that. And I also chair the STEM Strategy Equality subgroup established by the Scottish Government. So it's just to say I've got several hats on, uh, should any of those hats be appropriate for today. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, Miss Hay, you're welcome back Thank to you. the committee if you would like to make uh, Yeah, so obviously comments. I've met some of you before. So I'm a primary school teacher in Petuca in Glenrothes um, with a particular interest in engineering. I completed a postgraduate certificate in engineering STEM learning. Um, and kind of just reiterating a lot of what I said before, you know, the research and what I found in school is a, a lack of confidence for that particular. I spoke before about not bundling STEM as one thing and actually looking at the discrete parts and, and finding that perhaps technology and engineering is where the, there is a, a lack of confidence. Um, in our school, we've worked very hard to increase the visibility of engineering within our school. We're a pilot for um, the Institution of Primary Engineers, um, which is a whole school approach to developing security mindedness, STEM and employability skills in primary age children. Um, and we're kind of developing that and trying to really move to embedding um, STEM within what we do. And we have seen in that short time that confidence amongst staff is beginning to, to increase. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's where I come from. Ms. Beryl? Hi, I'm Shona. <clears throat> um, I'm a primary teacher um, in Edinburgh Council. I'm currently in primary four, but most of my experience has been within the early year setting, so nursery and primary one. Um, so hopefully I'll be able to give some experience from um, those years. And I'm also a parent of two children 
um, at nursery. So I come here not only as a teacher, but also as a parent. So hopefully I can share some knowledge from that side as well. Thank you very much. And also thank you very much for the submissions to the committee, which were very helpful. Um, I'm going to open up to um, questions and I invite Mr Gray. Uh, thanks very much and uh, good morning, panel. Um, we, in the course of the inquiry uh, that we've done, we've heard um, a lot of examples of good practice and good initiatives and um, uh, uh, really um, quite impressive work that's underway. Um, but it is largely driven or seems to be largely driven by um, the interest and passion of particular people in particular places. And to be fair, a lot of our witnesses have been those people, uh, as, as you would expect. Um, so, so my question really is, how can we mainstream uh, this work so that the children, young people's experience of STEM does, <clears throat> doesn't depend on the, the good luck of having uh, somebody with an engineering passion or, or whatever? Uh, available at the time. How, ca how can we make this central to our education system? Um, from my point of view, I think we need to obviously cascade or build, certainly within our school, we are now trying to build capacity within the rest of the staff. Um, you know, the head teachers recognised it myself and another teacher have that particular passion and what would what would happen if we were to suddenly go elsewhere um, so we are now trying this session to to kind of build capacity um, and I'll partly be funded to kind of work with other staff and um, kind of team teaching um, and giving them hopefully building their confidence to to the same level um, and I think that's really any opportunities that teachers can have to to work collegiately and to share their knowledge um, because there is a lack of confidence amongst other people i would like to point out that you know reading all the submissions and you know there are some excellent opportunities to get funding um you know the um, leadership and collegiate professional learning fund is there that can be used and it, it can pay for supply cover so that teachers can be released to to work with perhaps teachers who've got more experience. However, money is not an issue, it's actually the bodies. I mean, my head teachers actually said to me, it's not a problem finding money to cover you, but I can't physically get a supply teacher in here. So there's a, there's a bigger issue, actually, how do we address the shortage? It's well and good saying we can give you this money to fund you to be released from class, but if you can't get any supply teachers in to cover you, that, that's irrelevant. So I think there's a, a bigger issue in terms of um, how do we create a bank of supply teachers that can go into schools and release staff to then cascade that knowledge um, so that all schools are getting the same access. Because currently, I don't know whether your perspective is that, I mean, we spoke about that on the phone, That's a, it's a real mm. issue. Um, I spoke to my mum about this, she was a teacher, um, we lived in, in Gateshead for many years and I remembered that at one point when she first started, she worked for the local council um, as, a, as a permanent supply teacher. So they were based at a teacher centre and there was a, a team of them and what their job was was to go into... So if, if there was um, teachers that needed to come to the centre to do some training and whatever, they would be cascaded out to the schools to then, you know, to then cover for that. So, um, you know, that's something that the, that council at that time put a lot of money in. Um, so is that a solution somewhere that we can, you know, entice more people into supply teaching but have a permanent bank of teachers that can then go out to work with schools? Unfortunately, in Fife, our teacher centre got knocked down a few years ago, so I don't know where they would, would be based, but that's, that's my perspective. We have to get to a point where we can get teachers who are confident to um, work with other teachers and develop that confidence. Can, can, sorry. Can I, Go ahead. Uh, well, I was just going to say that I think, um, uh, I think what you've said is absolutely correct. I think cluster teaching is vitally important here because I think you've got to look to see where uh, you can get specialisms and that they can help out. 
So I think that is one way forward. I think that's a, a, an immediate way forward. I think uh, CLPL, and I think uh, I'm sure that uh, Alistair will say something from uh, CERC's point of view, because I think there is, a, there is a, a body that's set up to help you do that. But <clears throat> I think you could, you've got to look on, a, on the short term on some of these things we've been talking about is the short term and please don't leave your school. So because, you know, as a, <laughs> you know, I think it, it is important to recognise where there is strength and to build on that strength and to celebrate that strength and to share that good practice. But I think you can also look long term. So I think if you're looking long term, then what we should be doing is making sure that everybody that goes into primary school teaching has some sort of science uh, qualification at school. So uh, start off, let's make sure everybody has at least one level five qualification so that they have some confidence in science as a whole. And then maybe raise that or spread it to have more than two or three. But at the moment, um, there are a significant number of primary school teachers who enter the training, ITE, with absolutely no science background at all. And if you've no science background at all, then you are actually starting from a very low baseline. And how can you help, help and how can you inspire our young people to take up science and engineering if you've not been inspired yourself? So I think there is a, a long-term plan where you should, we should be looking to make sure that all our primary school teachers are comfortable teaching science and have an experience of that science as well. Because it's not only the science, it's the pedagogy of teaching science. It's, all, it's, it's the whole how you think scientifically, how you look at data, how you interpret that data, how you problem solve. That's all absolutely crucial. Um, and so we have got to should have a long-term plan and a short-term plan. Dr. Allen, was that supplementary in that? I'll, I'll let you come in at the moment and then I'll bring in the other panel members. Yeah, on, on that point, uh, you, you obviously, you're, you're making the point about um, entrance qualifications, yes. if you like, to, for, for teaching. Is there also a role, though, for the universities, for people coming into initial teacher education who don't have that science background to provide something? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I'm a firm believer of that, and I, and I think the curriculum for uh, ITE, whether they, they're coming in as a graduate into it or whether they're uh, starting off straight from school or college or wherever, I think, yes, there is a, um, there is a, there's work to be done to make sure that the curriculum is properly developed to allow teachers to have the confidence. And we come back to the confidence and it's about giving the teachers the confidence to be able to engage with the pupils to be able to deliver that. So yes, I, I firmly believe that uh, w there's work to be done across the board. I've highlighted one, you've highlighted another part. I think uh, uh, CLPL is another area that we could highlight. I think there's lots of different things that could be done, but I think there needs to be a degree of direction given. Quick supplementary yes, as well. To be supplementary to the practitioners on um, Professor Yellowtree's point with regard to those qualifications there, because there is a bit of a challenge here. We heard this last week um, because our primary teachers are meant to be generalists, obviously, and, and our secondary teachers are subject specialists. And I'm a modern studies teacher to train. I, I'd love uh, every primary teacher to have a higher modern studies, but practically that's not realistic. Um, I'd like to hear from the practitioners if they would agree with that assertion about having that N5 level qualification, because at the moment under the BGE, everybody coming into the profession should at least have an exposure until the end of S3 um, to science and technology through the BGE anyway. Do you think it should be a requirement that they have that N5 level qualification as practitioners? Um, I, said, I, mean, I said before that when this was raised that personally I would be hesitant to go and for it. I think there are already barriers to getting people to become teachers and I just feel to add another barrier might just restrict the numbers. However, I, I do see that we need to do something so, um, you know, whether they can, teachers could do further training whilst they're already on the course. But I would just be hesitant to create more barriers when we need more people to enter the profession. Um, I think, yes, I think it is useful um, to have National 5 and perhaps a science or a um, computing um, subject. But I also think there's scope for working 
more collegiately with our secondary um, colleagues. And I think also looking to industry for potential um, links as well to get sort of expertise and to get training with that so that when teachers are in school that we have access to people who have the knowledge and skill and resources to be able to support us to teach our youngsters. Mr McGregor. I concur with what my, my colleagues have said here. There's probably three things I just want to touch on and what's been said already. The first one is that whole thing about um, teacher self-confidence. I think that's really, really important that they have that degree of self-confidence to go into the classroom and, and to actively participate in, in STEM-based activities. But I think what we're also missing is it's not just about self-confident. You can be very, very self-confident, but if you don't have that underpinning knowledge and skills, um, to support that level of confidence, then it's our learners that are going to be disadvantaged. So I, I think the confidence and the competence need to go hand, hand in hand. Um, linked to the, the teacher training, I think there is an opportunity. So we're currently having dialogue with um, some of the IT, ITEs in, in Scotland in relation to digital skills. We talked to one university who've got a digital skills program that's fully integrated into their, their primary ITE. We talked to another one and it's um, probably an hour and a half session. So what we want to do is, is to work with the, the, the ITEs to provide that level of digital support. And I suppose on, on that journey as an organisation, we are looking to become a credit rating body. And again, we see that we would have a natural role to, to work alongside ITEs to make sure that we're providing a master's level type um, qualification to support primary teachers coming into, um, into the teaching profession. I suppose I'm a bit of an optimist, and I think there are opportunities for us. I think there are opportunities from the Scottish Government's STEM strategy. Um, I think that could be a, a real hook for local authorities, and, and particularly our RICs in, in particular. Discussions that um, I have with primary teachers who come in to, to start to undertake professional learning, they say to us, if, if STEM isn't on the school's improvement plan, then it's not going to go anywhere. And I think there is an opportunity with Education Scotland's recent recruitment of their STEM advisors to, to have these, um, that particular resource as, as, a, as a positive tool to move forward in relation to making sure that, that STEM appears. And I suppose there's always this perception as well that if STEM doesn't appear in an improvement, in a school's improvement plan, but literacy and numeracy does, that means you can't do STEM. What we say is, in actual fact, you can use STEM as the vehicle for taking forward that literacy and numeracy. So I, I think I like to be positive. I think there's an opportunity. And I think you know, the, the Education Scotland regional advisors are just in post. And I think there's an opportunity for us to engage positively with them to make sure that the, the message is, is being spread. Yes, Dr. Petrie. <coughs> So I think it's another way to look at this, which is do all primary schools have to be science and technology specialists? Or do we change the primary school model slightly to have one or two science and technology specialists in each school who deliver that teaching and who also upskill the other primary school teachers? And I've seen this model work. So there's a Fintry primary school near us have actually hired somebody mainly to teach computing. She does some other teaching as well, but she's, she's a computing specialist, and it's quite a big primary school. But that's worked really well for them, and they're now a very digitally literate STEM school um, due to that model. And so I feel that for primary school teachers, we might just be asking too much to ask them to be specialists at everything and be able to teach everything to the same level. And so maybe a new model is what's, what's required. Okay. Yeah, Mr. I, think that, I think that links to what um, Leslie was talking about in relation to that, that cluster-based mm, model. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. both um, CERT through its primary cluster programme and also um, the Wood Foundation Education Scotland through the RACE programme, it isn't about making sure that every single teacher is a, is a STEM specialist. It's, a, it's about saying, let's take some um, key devoted primary teachers, LEUs, practitioners such as, as yourselves, and let's provide you with some enhanced mentoring and leadership skills. Let's provide you with additional practical hands-on experiential type of professional learning that you can then go back into your school and work with your peers and work with your learners. You can go back into your local authority and, and cascade that CPD in, in that way. And therefore, it's not meaning that everyone has to be that specialist, but it's a cascade model. And, and certainly, 
you know, we've piloted a primary cluster programme for, for the past six years, independently evaluated, and it's coming out saying it works. You have highly, highly motivated mm -hmm. mentors. Mm -hmm. These mentors have developed their own pedagogic and assessment skills, and they have promoted science and technology uh, activities in the classrooms across the region. So there are, there are models there. I think we need to build upon mm -hmm. these models that have got a proven track record <coughs> to work. Ms. He, you want to? Yeah, I'm just going to add um, to, to both those points that um, in our school for the last probably three years, um, STEM has primarily been delivered by one of my colleagues, um, Laura Peden, as part of our non-class contact agreement. So um, during the time that she had the children, the rest of the staff agreed that they wanted Laura to teach the STEM. Um, so we've been doing that for three years. We're now at a point next year where Laura's going to be back into class. Um, and there was a real fear that between both of us, that if she's back in her own class now and the rest of these learners who've been getting access to STEM activities weekly for you know, several years are suddenly not going to, to have that, um, that access, which is why we are building capacity amongst the staff. So while I'm saying I don't necessarily think a single specialist in a primary school to do all of the teaching of all the learners is the right answer because then if that person suddenly leaves, then none of the rest of the staff have the, the capacity to deliver it themselves. Whereas the, the model that you're saying, whereas um, Laura and I are going to be mentoring other staff so that they, they will still be delivering these experiences. I think to have somebody like a like in a high school, a, a specialist that only does that, I just think that, um, that's not the best situation. All, st all, te all teachers need to be giving their learners opportunities. Um, to, and if the, you know, if, if you don't, if you don't do it, you lose it. So if the, you know, if, if we're not teaching STEM, then that confidence and competence is never going to grow. It's a case. Oh, oh, really helpful. And just to kind of point of clarification. Um, because this point about the national improvement framework is an important one, I think, and we. Um, had evidence on this from Education Scotland uh, and the Scottish Government last week and their point was that STEM is not part of the National Improvement Framework in the way that literacy, numeracy and wellbeing is. So just, just, just to check, I think it was um, Alistair in particular spoke about this. Are you saying that as long as that is the case, all the efforts that you've been describing um, I was going to say may come to naught, that's, that's an exaggeration, but will be an uphill struggle because schools will see their, their required focus as being much more about literacy, numeracy and, and well-being. Is that, is that fair? I think there perhaps is some anecdotal evidence to support that assertion. Yeah. So I'm just going to... Um, come in with, with some anecdotal evidence, which I thought was quite interesting. We had the Trick DigiFest, which is a CPD event for primary school teachers, teaching mainly computing skills about four weeks ago in, in Dundee on a Saturday. And the first thing I would say is that actually we had over 100 um, school, school teachers show up on, a, on their day off unpaid, which shows the willingness, I think, to teach and to learn these areas, so it's really good. But one of the teachers at that event stood up and said, at the moment, I don't deliver the ILOs in computing science at all to my class. And she said, and I think I can get away with that because nobody will ever inspect those ILOs for computing science. And that really surprised me. It surprised me that actually, she didn't say it was fine. She was there to learn how to do it and she wanted to do it, but she hand delivered for a number of years and she thought that nobody would ever pick up on that as being an issue. Um, so I wonder how true that is throughout some of our schools. Okay, um, I'm going to bring in Ms. Smith. Yeah, thank you. Um, Professor Yellowlees, um, I'm very interested in this uh, issue about staffing. And you will recall at the 2016 um, festival that the Royal Society of Chemistry held, held across in Dynamic Earth, that they made a very specific call that they would like to see a specialist scientist in every primary school. Do you feel that that was the right call, given what uh, some of your colleagues and some of our previous witnesses were saying, that perhaps that's not necessary if we can ensure that there is team teaching and there's cluster? And or do you feel that that was just a, 
a nice additional thing that would be very helpful to science if it was possible? Well, I think we'd all agree it, it would be nice if it was possible because I think uh, we'd all agree that if you could have a specialist subject in, in lots of different areas, why wouldn't you have that? Um, so I think it's as a, 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 an ultimate goal, what's not to like about it? But <clears throat> as a realistic goal, I think probably it would be... Um, and here I'm trying to speak on behalf of all the learned societies rather than I know I have a, a special affiliation with the Royal Society of Chemistry, but I'm trying to step back from that now um, <clears throat> and say that, uh, that I think I, I'm a great fan and I think the whole learned societies group is, are great fans of cluster teaching. So I think if you can get um, a specialist teacher in, 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 or various specialist teachers, because if you're talking about cluster teaching, then you can have various people coming in at various times. Uh, and I think that way you cover much more of science, engineering, technology and maths than you would if you just had one, because how do you be a specialist? Uh, how can you be a specialist by its very nature and cover all of science and technology? You can't. So I think it's much better to go the cluster route and have different specialist teachers come in and spend a day at a time at a different school or, or and maybe only for a term and then go somewhere else. I think what I don't like is um, single intervention. I think that doesn't work. That's been proven not to work. It's very attractive to, to groups to do sing, single intervention because then you feel you've achieved something, you've done something, but have you really made a lasting difference? No, you haven't. So I think we have to go away from that. And I come back slightly from what the Royal Society of Chemistry advocated three years ago. Helpful. And that, that ties in, uh, Mr McGregor, with an interesting point you made about you can have all the confidence in the world, but if you don't have the necessary knowledge and the uh, specific science uh, training, uh, you're not going to go terribly far uh, in this respect. Can I ask you, what, what discussions have you had, um, a very specific uh, question about what discussions you've had with the universities? Um, you mentioned one example perhaps hasn't then progressed as much as one of the other ones. And what discussions have you had with the GTCS about trying to promote um, more of this uh, specialist knowledge and therefore a, a greater lead into um, an affinity with the science subjects that obviously promotes that greater confidence and enjoyment of teaching them? Yeah, so uh, within our organisation, we have a, um, an advisory governance structure and we have a professional development advisory board and that's got representatives from the ITE sector, it's got representatives from Education Scotland, it's got um, representatives from um, the Scottish Government, etc., um, and also with GTCS. And we have floated the idea of CERC working in partnership to provide a certificated programme for practitioners, which is based on developing that level of, um, of competence required to undertake not just science, but STEM-based activities. I, I would say I think it's probably going to take us a significant period of time to move that forward quickly. Be there. Um, I, I'm very interested in that comment. Do you feel that those who are coming uh, or who would like to come into uh, the teaching profession as STEM experts, uh, uh, is it a question that they don't have the necessary knowledge and background from their university degrees and their experience in other educational institutions? Or is it a case of not being uh, confident and sufficiently competent when it comes to disseminating that knowledge and teaching skills in the classroom? Because these are two different things. I think it's probably a combination of both. I Through this problem. I, I think it's an ongoing, an ongoing discussion that, that we continue to have with the, the IT, ITE institutions and, and with General Teaching Council of Scotland. I, I think there are they see the they see the benefits of that type of um, opportunity moving forward, but I think there is a. I think it would be it will be a challenge to move that forward in a, in a timely manner. Sorry, can you can you just explain why? Because I think, you know, we, we want to see this progress. Hence the reason why we're doing this inquiry. And if there is some block in the system that's not allowing you to further these ideas and to ensure that those who are becoming science teachers are of the the highest order. Um, what is it that um, you're, a bit, I, I you're a bit reluctant I, to say? I, I, what I think it comes down to, the, to the, the view that perhaps there isn't sufficient time within 
a post-grad primary teacher's um, timetable to, okay. to allow that to take place. We have other suggestions that we can make in relation to twilight sessions, summer school sessions, um, on, online type of, of, of activities to support that. And I say discussions are at, at an early stage, but like you, I would quite like to see that fast-tracked as well. And can I just finish, uh, if I may, Professor Yellowlees, do, do you agree with that point, that that's something that we need to uh, work on to ensure that universities and other educational institutions are developing these points? Uh, absolutely, because I think um, there are many uh, providers of ITE in, in Scotland, uh, and, but I think if we're wanting to improve the lot of all our children at schools in Scotland, then you have to do it across the board. Uh, and you have to make sure that everybody has bought into this and everybody is carrying that out. Otherwise, you'll still get a disparity of experience for the children, and that's not what we're wanting. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Gray? Thank you. Uh, I'd like to return to the points around CPD, and specifically what Alistair uh, brought up uh, in, in your opening remarks around early years. We got some interesting evidence in our last session on this around the, the tension that there perhaps is with giving uh, early years practitioners, um, with, I'm not talking about nursery teachers here, but the rest of the early years workforce, giving them the kind of CPD opportunities in STEM that are required when that's a workforce with a much higher turnover than the teaching workforce. And it was raised with us essentially that there's a, a reluctance from management, from local authorities there, to spend money on a workforce that has that higher level of, of turnover. Is that something that you've detected or experienced? What's, what's your understanding of, of how much access those early years practitioners are getting? I, I suppose from, from a CERC perspective, this is a, a new area for us. So we've only really focused on early years in, in the past year. So we have some very specific early year interventions that, that we offer. Um, we wish to continue to, to progress um, with that on, a, on an ongoing basis. Um, so I can only, only talk from, from where, we, where we are just now in relation to our, our early attempts to provide support for that particular um, education community. Um, from a nursery teacher's background, um, in terms of early years practitioners, a lot of the staff who I have worked with have undergone training such as Forest Kindergarten and they have a lot of STEM training background but there were then barriers to them being able to undertake those activities, such as um, the short nursery hours, sort of three hours, 10 minutes. By the time the children were on the minibus and ready to go, it was time to come back. Um, there was barriers in terms of staff to children ratios, um, funding for, for minibuses. So perhaps the issue is not so much the high staff turnover, but it's actually how the staff can deliver these activities um, with these barriers um, in place. And, and that's not, I'm not talking about that across the board, that's just anecdotal experience that I've got. Um, but the, there are quite a few barriers to addressing these, these things and st staff, high staff turnover potentially might not be one of them. And so in, in that particular situation, was that something that the local authority were trying to work with nurseries to, to address that? Or was it something that wasn't quite filtering back up to a level where the support could be brought in to address it? N not as, as far as I knew. I think it was, um, we, this is the hours that the children have to do and you have to either make it work um, or, or don't undertake take those activities and try and find something else within, within your setting. So the children were missing out on that forest kindergarten experience. Um, linked to the, the, the two things that you were, you were saying there, our work that we do with the early years practitioners and also now with the, the, the child minding um, education community, um, where there is you know, issues in relation to being released to come out to do face-to-face -face type of, of professional learning, the, the time taken away from your, your teaching duties or your practitioner duties to do that. So we operate um, a sort of online digital type of platform that's a twilight session. That's about trying to um, still do face-to-face -face professional learning to support an understanding of STEM based on practical activities. But it's done through um, 
uh, Thunder Digital Technology. So we will broadcast live from our um, broadcast studios in Dunfermline out to potentially um, you know, 45, 50 schools where there are a variety of different types of practitioners who will be there. We send out boxes of resources in advance and we basically do a cook-along. So we say, here's the resources, here's the activities. We will show you what you can do with these resources, but we'll also share with you what the underpinning um, knowledge is linked to this, what is the scientific or STEM-based uh, concepts and principles are. That seems to work because it's a short intervention, usually an hour to an hour and a half maximum. So that does work. And it's interesting that um, having a discussion next week with, with one local authority who want to work in partnership with CERC to put in place a, a primary cluster type programme, but very specifically focusing on that transition between nursery and, and primary one. So we will be hopefully working it in partnership to, to see what that looks like, because we've talked about these cluster models, but the cluster model will only work if there is a legacy in place to make sure that is sustainable. And that's the beauty of the, of the programme that we've piloted over the past, the past six years, is that it's proven that there is a legacy there. So when you have staff churn and you have staff movement, it doesn't mean the programme stops, because that whole thing about the rollout of um, career-long professional learning that's very bespoke to that local community is still there. And the legacy is there, which for us is really, really important. And are you working? Sure are you working with both local authority and private sector early years practitioners, the, or is it just local authorities for at, now? At the moment, because of our funding regime, we are working with local authorities. And do you expect that there is an appetite for this within the private sector? Have you have you had any contact from folk yes. within the private sector? Yeah. We have. There is a, a a massive appetite for doing it. Um, but again, the nature of the funding that we have as an organisation is that comes from, in, in many circumstances, from the public first, par, public purse, either through Scottish Government or through local authorities who are members of our organisation, and therefore our focus is primarily working in the state sector. Thanks. Uh, and just one uh, last question, Convener. Moving away from early years and back into to primary, uh, but again, looking at local authority level of understanding of this. Do you believe that local authorities have a depth of understanding about staff need for CPD in terms of the specific subjects within STEM, or is the attitude at a local authority level that STEM is the priority, as if it is one umbrella term and staff require training in STEM, whatever they might understand that to be? I, I, I think that may vary from local authority to local authority. There is, there is one local authority who I know have put a blanket ban on, on anybody travelling to any form of professional learning out with that local authority. That's a significant dis disadvantage. And I suppose, fr from my perspective, you know, we, we keep on talking about, about STEM. And I suppose, because STEM is used so much, it's got a degree of visibility, but I also wonder whether when you talk to young people about STEM, it also has a barrier. It's a barrier to access because you talk about scientists and there's a look of fear. You talk about um, engineering, there's a look of fear. We have primary practitioners come into us and, and we do science-based um, work with them, science-based professional learning. We don't take them into labs. We don't get them to wear white coats. We do it in a standard classroom scenario because that breaks down the barriers and the perceptions of what STEM is about. So for me, when we talk about STEM, I don't think of it as being science, engineering, technology, mathematics. I see it as being that sort of um, collection of transferable skills within the context of science or technology. And for me, it's about the promotion of the skills yeah. that, that, mm -hmm. that STEM subjects can give you. That's, to us, more important than the, the silos of science and technology and engineering and mathematics. Can I just follow it's up on that? I think um, STEM as a, as a, a, a word, I suppose, uh, was very useful initially because it brought together um, a lot of the pedagogy, a lot of the <coughs> discipline of, uh, and, and a, a lot of the discipline of undertaking science, if you want, it translates to social science. I mean, it's not limited to that, but it, it now almost people think of STEM as, oh, that's, every, you know, that's everything. And I think what we should be looking at is interdisciplinarity. 
um, and where STEM can mean interdisciplinarity in this, across the sciences and technology and engineering and maths, then it's working well. Um, when you think of it as a single subject, then that's not working well. But I think what's underpinning it um, is, is learning this, is helping our young people gain the skills um, and to be able to use those skills, which then make them highly employable, great. And the earlier you start that, the better, because then they're not going to be frightened. Um, and I don't know, I, I, I mean, for me, I'm just, uh, I feel so sad when people say they're frightened of engineering or, or science. Why would you be frightened of it? It's really exciting. It's what, you know, at the moment, our, our lives are... are uh, underpinned by a lot of what science and engineering can, can deliver. Uh, and, and I would want our young people to be excited by that and would want them to uh, be positively engaged with it and take up with it um, and not be stand back and say, this isn't for me, it's for everyone and it should be for everyone. And that's the message we've got to get across. And if you want to extend that, you've got to get across to the parents as well because they've got to understand science is for everybody. I think, Ross, to come back to your, your point about local authorities' perspective, so uh, Circus an organisation is a, a member-based organisation, so we are funded by every local authority, and, uh, and certainly we are the first port of call for local authorities who are looking for STEM-based, practical, hands-on, experiential, professional learners. They will, they will come to us. So I, I think they, they, they know there is at least one mechanism there for them, but there continues to be that, that issue that our practitioners have talked about, and that's being released to attend these types of, of interventions. So as an organisation, we have to think about how we respond to that. So yet we do a lot of practical um, activities, practical professional learning within our organisation in Fairmont, but we now also go out and do that locally, uh, more, lo more local interventions, because we realise there are issues with release. I, w I was undertaking a, a, an event on Saturday on behalf of the committee and um, with the cadet organisations in Scotland and one of the people I was speaking to say they did STEM by stealth. So when they do the engineering and they do the work, they, everybody's engaged and as soon as they brand it as being anything to do with STEM, people get yeah, writing. So um, just a, another little anecdotal piece. Oliver, I knew you wanted to come in as supplementary. Could you go on with your substantive questions after it as well, please? Uh, hey, yes, Kavita, thank you uh, for that. Um, Alistair McGregor, I wanted to come back uh, just to the comments you'd made to uh, Ross Greer. In my local authority, the Scottish Government, according to their own figures, I sort of suggest that almost 40% of ELC uh, will have to be delivered by the PVI sector. Do you think then that there's a case for looking at, at how we fund support uh, f for those groups? Because obviously, um, you know, that, that, that will create an, an inequity for the, the young people accessing a government-funded provision uh, that, that's been offered by others. There, there is an, an opportunity. Opportunity comes as a, a cost. As an organisation, we can, we can do more to support, but we are probably at a tipping point in relation to the, the, the level of professional learning that we can offer. So last year, funded to undertake 5,200 CPD units across the education community in Scotland. Um, we managed to do more than 6,500, so well above our, but we're now at a tipping point whereby we are kind of limited to what we can do in relation to the, the resources we have available to support that. So for us, they're about trying to work in partnerships, so working in partnership with the Scottish Childminding Association, working in partnership with Early, Early Year Scotland to see what we can do in partnership to try to support the, the needs that are undoubtedly going to be there in the system. I guess would other panel members think it was odd that you know, we've got a significant proportion of a government-funded initiative being provided through the PVI sector, but maybe less training and support going to going to going to practitioners working in that area? Is that not something I think I'm able to comment on? I think you've led us well to say yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, no, it, it, it just does concern me because I do think it's I do think it's a, it's an anomaly uh, that has been that's, that's been created. Um, I also was going to move on uh, more substantively to uh, rural areas um, and whether or not you think uh, that there is a uh, good enough uh, provision um, there. Um, and I was particularly interested in terms of specialisation and, and cluster models because obviously they become uh, more difficult. Uh, when you're talking about one or two teacher schools, of which there, there are many across Scotland. Do you think we need 
to do more for rural areas. So I can come in there. Um, we, Dundee obviously is a city, but we're quite close to a lot of rural areas. So I work with quite a lot of rural primary schools. And in the one or two teacher schools, there's some excellent practice. I mean, there's one school um, quite close to us where if you talk to the, the, the pupils, they'll actually say, oh, we're a very computer science-based school, and they're very proud of that. And that's, you know, the primary twos and threes. There's other schools where they really struggle with the resources. And I think part of that's probably the teaching. If you don't have a teacher with knowledge and advice of science and technology, that's always going to be a problem. It's also the physical resources. We see schools, like the bigger schools and city centres, often have an IT suite where they can go in and they can deliver things like computer science teaching. That's less common in, in the rural schools that I see anyway. Um, I know of a school where they have 12 laptops that they wheel into the classroom as and when required, but they're so old that they have to be plugged in. And so it actually becomes a tripping hazard. And, and the teacher said to me, I'd love to do something that was quite physical, because these are primary two students and pupils, and quite physically and active and have them doing something and then doing it on a computer, but you can't. You can either do one or the other, because it's a tripping hazard if you have the computers in the room. Um, the internet is genuinely an issue in quite a lot of our rural schools. I hear one, of, one rural school said, we can't actually have all the computers on the internet at once or it will just crash reliably, which is a, a major issue for teaching computing science. So I think there is specific issues that the rural schools have that perhaps the city centre schools don't have, and especially those that are two classrooms and say one or two teachers. I think there is an issue with uh, rural schools and making sure that the, the pupils there have the experiences that city, uh, city pupils have because, of course, the science centres, which are funded to do a lot of this work as well, are city-based. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know a lot of them have extensive rural programmes, but still it's not the same, is it? Um, so I think, there, I think we have to spend some time seeing how best to help all our communities uh, have access to STEM teaching. I think um, that computer internet-based learning has its place. But I think for those of us who have enjoyed uh, a, a career or an education steep, uh, deeply uh, entrenched in science and engineering, would also argue that you do need to have the lab-based experience. You do need to get your hands on making, I mean, that's what the attraction for many of doing science is, is doing the practical aspects of it. So I think we have to make sure that we have a balance there. Um, and so to rely simply on the internet to give all that experience, in my book, won't work, uh, because you'll still have, at the end of the day then, people who are not confident about undertaking an experiment um, and sometimes failing that experiment. And you can fail on a computer, of course you can, but I think it's that experience of a lab-based and putting on the white lab coat, if that's what, uh, you know, chimes in your mind of doing a, a lab-based experiment. But I think that is important and we mustn't ever forget that because if we forget that and we discount practical-based learning at that level, then we're um, ignoring and we're discounting the whole of STEM, in my opinion. And I think rural schools, for me, encompass that beautifully. And, and if we can solve it there, then we've solved it everywhere. So we have to, to look hard to see how we can do it. And do you, do you have any suggestions? Um, yes, I do. I, th I think, um, so I, I, I like the, um, going back to more like a cluster approach where we've put in place uh, experts throughout the whole of Scotland, each district now, each area has um, a, 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 an expert in that. Uh, I think it'll take time for them to go around because it's, it's like a pyramid effort, you know, and we've put the ones in the top and we have to cascade it down. But I think we have started well. Uh, I think with these new initiatives will help that happen, but it will take time. Thank you, Dr. Allen. Thank you. Um, I was interested um, uh, in some of the issues around uh, overcoming inequalities. Um, we've talked in this committee before about how early um, you can see educational or op life opportunity inequalities uh, emerging in, in, in young children. So 
Uh, I, was, I was interested to know what can be done to ensure that uh, at the very earliest stages we are, without entering into the discussion about how you measure these inequalities, what we're doing to recognise inequalities in terms of access to science and, and, and scientific outlook and scientific opportunities. What, what, what is the first thing that can be done in, in early years to, to recognise where those gaps exist? So I think we have to look at the curriculum as a whole. Um, I think uh, we have to look to see where um, and to be very self-critical of where those inequalities lie and make sure that we uh, consciously address that. Um, but to do that, I think it has to be done across the board uh, for, for everything, for all subjects, and science will just benefit from that as well. Um, so I am a great favour, I'm a, a great um, believer in the uh, work that's being done um, with the Institute of Physics as a whole school at attempt. Um, it was went in as the starting on physics uh, and they quickly realised that actually it was better to do it across the whole school. So I'm a, I think that should be looked at, um, but we've got to just be a lot more self-critical um, and where it makes sense to be very prescriptive about it. Um, you know, I think we just have to sometimes just bite the bullet and, and, and say, this is going to, you know, we're going to try this. Based on experience elsewhere, where it is available. I think interdisciplinarity actually has a really big part to play here. I mean, if we look at computing, if we look at degrees, we find that the traditional engineering degrees are still male-dominated. I can tell you that, at least in Dundee, our anatomy degree is female-dominated. Where do we see a science and technology degree that's equal? Biomedical engineering. Biomedical engineering is, you know, it's actually slightly dominated by women, but it's about 50-50. And it's because it applies to the engineering, it appeals to science, it appeals to the medical. And that, for me, is what we have to do right from the early years in the primary school. So it doesn't become about you're either an engineer or you're you know, a biologist. In the modern world, there is no difference. It's, it's, it's about interdisciplinarity and everything working together. Some, some of that uh, equality or some of the overcoming inequality is obviously also about overcoming um, economic inequalities, if you, if you want to, to put it like that, but certainly uh, overcoming uh, um, deprivation. And I, I was interested in something that Professor Yellow Lees, you said um, about uh, including parents. Yeah. Uh, I wonder, can, can any of you say a bit more about what can be actively done to bring parents into class? And I've certainly seen examples of where this, can be, where this is done to overcome parental fears, never mind the, the children's fears about science, what, what can be done about that? I think it's not only the fears, I think it's misconceptions that people have. So, uh, you know, uh, if we talk about engineering, there are a lot of misconceptions Absolutely. about what, yeah. what an engineer is, particularly from the parents. So I think there, there is a whole body of work that has to be done, and, and for me it's all about building science capital. It's all about making sure that our society um, is uh, understands where the importance and where science and technology and engineering, where it all lies and where it underpins. So, of course, it's much easier to talk about pupils, isn't it? Because they all come into a, you know, into a, a central, uh, into a school, uh, and we can uh, then cope with the curriculum of schools. But I think there are many events that uh, certainly I've been involved in where you in, uh, go in and involve the children during the day um, and then they bring their parents back at night. However, that tends to bring the parents in that are already interested in that um, because the children are interested in that. And I think it is a real difficulty we have where with the people who have not bought into um, where the importance of stem where the importance of science where the importance of engineering uh, lies and i wish i had the answer to that but many people i mean i think i think we all have a part to play so i think uh, science centers have a part to play 
I think science festivals have a part to play, and we know that there's science festivals now being developed across Scotland in rural areas as well. And I think although they, you could you could label them as single interventionist. I don't think you should see them as that because they have a much wider reach than that. Um, but I think we have to look to do that, and I think we have to look at the media. How can we engage with the media to make everybody more aware of the benefits of science and engineering? So I think there's not a single answer. I wish there was, because, and, and then we would have done it, wouldn't we? But uh, that's true across the board. But it must be possible because if I look across the world, there are certain other countries that have huge science capital. That their, 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 um, their communities are well versed in the importance of it. Uh, and we should look to see how they've done that and why that is, is why it's worked and what we can do better here. Yeah, I know. Well, I think uh, many, if you're talking about uh, engineering, for example, I would look at India, for example, yeah. Yeah. is a hugely successful country where engineers are highly regarded, highly valued, um, and, you know, uh, children go to school with the expectation that many of them will leave as engineers. We do not have that in Scotland. Um, and, um, and much of the Far East is like that as well. So we should look to see why they value it so much more than we do in Scotland. Just come in. Could I just come in um, two points here? Um, firstly, when you're talking about parental engagement, I think that's a much bigger discussion and it's not maybe just STEM. You'll find um, quite often that the parents who will come into this, this school will be the same parents all the time and that actually engaging all the parents, it's, it's a much kind of bigger issue with everything. You know, if you put on any event within school or you invite parents in, you're going to get a, a cohort of parents who want to be there and there will be parents who are disengaged and who don't want to be part of their, their child. So I think parental engagement is a kind of much bigger issue. Um, and picking up on your point about other countries, um, I came across an example in Germany where big mobile phone companies are creating resources for schools, discovery boxes. Um, they're doing training for early year teachers and it's widespread, widely spread um, across Germany. And so there are other countries who are kind of promoting STEM, if you like, within schools and certainly within early years setting. And that would lend itself perfectly to learning through play and learning through discovery in the early years. That's Petrie. Sorry to come back in on a point that um, Leslie made, which is, I think, with parents, and I've heard, I was involved recently in Scotland's biggest ever parent evening, and I heard this quite a lot, they think science is hard. They think science and engineering is for the academically brilliant who are going to go to university and get a first-class degree and then do a PhD. And we've got to change that message. I mean, actually, there's lots of things like apprenticeships out there, modern apprenticeships, graduate apprenticeships, foundation apprenticeships in science, and especially in engineering. And, so, and I don't think that message is out there. So I wonder if somehow we can pair the apprenticeship message, which I'm a big fan of, with this whole idea of science and engineering being for everyone and there being career paths for everyone. OK, Miss Hay. Yeah, I'm just going to reiterate um, Shona's point about parental engagement that's an issue, whatever it is. We've been doing a lot of outdoor learning in our school and we um, used one of our providers to put on a, an event in school so that the parents could engage in the same activities as the children and get an understanding of what they were learning. And we had a handful of parents. Really disappointing. So that, that's, that's across the board. Um, one thing that we have done, there are misconceptions. I mean, the research that I did last year for my postgrad yeah, there's a lot of misconceptions about um, about engineers and those careers. And actually, the engineers that I spoke to in industry, um, most of them had been influenced towards that career path by a, a supportive parent. Mm -hmm. So th there definitely is issues there that need to be addressed, um, you know, within the media and things like that. But one thing that we've done in our school, we had a big STEM event um, a few months ago, and we invited the, the parents in. Again, yes, you get your cohort that always come but there was other parents who perhaps don't normally and they were you know building capla blocks with the children they were making things out of connects and you know there was a real kind of buzz about the room in a real sense of, 
oh, I had no idea that these were the kind of things that they were doing. And, you know, the value of actually just, you know, it was like we did this thing, it was 100, 100 blocks, 100 seconds, see what you could build. I mean, you know, it was like something of X Factor that was like, yeah, come on, all this chain. And they didn't realise that, I, well, you know, it's just building things out. Well, it's not just building things out of bricks, but, you know, actually bring it down to a level that they could kind of relate to. Um, so that's certainly something as a school that we are looking to replicate on an annual basis to to get to actually work with the the children on these kind of things, um, you know, because we can do our bit to, in school to try and develop that kind of STEM capital. But unless something's happening, you know, at home with the parents, I think it's it's going to be a challenge. I'm going to bring Miss Lamont in on that. Area. Yeah, I want to. Ask, I think I'm interested not just in access to STEM subjects and all those experience but impact of disadvantage. So it's not just there's not much access, that it'll be disproportionately less access for um, maybe more vulnerable children. Can I ask first of all about looked after children, care experienced children, if you're relying on peer parental engagement, how do you make up for that for a young person who might be in a, a care setting? In our school, I'm trying to think when we probably had that event um, we have maybe a, one or two looked after children um, but in, certainly in one in one case they still had a, a carer with them to come in and engage in that, that activity so I mean that is an issue but not just for looked after it's an issue for any children with working parents and I'm a teacher and you know my girls came home the other day and upset because I wasn't there to share their learning with them but I need to be in front of a class, so it's a, it's an issue that's an, to engage parents if they're working parents, because nowadays mum and dad are working, um, and and they can't always go. Um, so I think that is a, that is a, a difficulty. Thanks for that one. <laughs> um, I wondered just on the question. I know that the, um, the learning um, group that you represent did some work on um, the issue of resources. In a school, I wonder if you want to expand on that because my concern from what I read from that report was there is an issue about resource and support, but when you then rely on parents to fill the gap, disadvantaged uh, young people, Absolutely. that is reinforced. Absolutely. So yes, we did a, a body of work in, in 2014. We were actually talking the other day about uh, the need to maybe revisit uh, some of the findings that we, we did there. Um, and there was an issue across, all, across the board uh, of the resources that were available to teachers in primary schools to be able to undertake um, STEM, type uh, STEM type activities. Uh, and when we drilled further into that, um, it was a case of if the school didn't have the resource because perhaps the local authority hadn't given them the resource or that the school had opted uh, to spend their money some other way, which um, th these hard decisions have to be taken, and I think we all recognise that, that quite often they had to go to external sources of funding. And, of course, the most common source of funding was parental. Parental funding um, to maybe set up a club or whatever it was or to be able to provide the... Um, materials, the equipment, whatever it was, to be able to do the STEM type activity. And so there is obviously a correlation then between uh, the children who come f with a background that the parents can afford that um, or have access to it, because quite often as well, I think we shouldn't underplay the uh, parents who will go in and help teach some of these subjects as well. Let's not... Uh, underplay the, 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 the contribution that makes as well. And so, yes, you're right. Um, that will, does impact and impinge on those from less advantaged backgrounds. Uh, what is, I mean, did you make some recommendations around that? Are we seeing, in the same way that we've had an, um, an investigation into um, music tuition, that actually one of its problems is not regarded as core, should these practical activities be regarded as the core business of a school and therefore it shouldn't be at the mercy of whether you've got a talented parent or yeah. parents with resources that can fund that? What, well, would, I what, would, would you, what would your recommendation be coming? I mean, I'd be interested if you are updating, I'm sure the committee would be as well, but just that challenge 
that actually you could end up in a place where we're reinforcing inequality because of the way in which these resources are accessed? I think we were reluctant to make very firm conclusions because we were aware that we had a very small sample size. So we, had, uh, we only received responses from 39 primary schools and I think uh, we really wished to engage with um, Education Scotland, etc., and other bodies to be able to expand that. Uh, that was not taken up at the time. Uh, perhaps now's a, a better time. You know, it's all sometimes it relies on timing, um, and perhaps we should go and look to see if there are um, there is an appetite to look further for that, because I think. Um, Data, I'm, I'm a scientist, so I love data. Um, and I, because I think you can then use the data, uh, whether you use it as your, um, your baseline and you, uh, you measure from that or, or whether it's telling you something concrete in the first thing, but I think we need more data there. But it does worry me that um, not everybody has access to that. So would I believe, do I believe it should be um, compulsory and in there? Yes, of course I do. But then I would say that, wouldn't I? Um, but I would say that for a whole variety of reasons. I think it's giving uh, a very good training to our young people. I think it's giving them a skill set that is, uh, is important in whatever line of um, study or, or work they go into. Um, and I think just increasing the science capital, I come back to that again, of our population is one that will only end up uh, yielding positive results. So, yes, I would make it compulsory. Um, okay, thank you. Mr. Yeah, I, would, I, would, I would agree with that. I mean, we have um, a large number of um, primary school teachers, early practitioners who come through CERC as an organisation. Um, on an annual basis, so for primary, 1st of April 18, 31st of March 2019, we had 3,285 primary attendances at our professional learning courses. It would be soul-destroying if we undertake all of that hands-on, practical, experiential learning underpinned by development of knowledge and skills if they then go back into their classroom situation and can't undertake that in the classroom situation. We're very fortunate. Some of the money that we are allocated from, for example, Scottish Government, we dedicate to um, providing resources for those delegates who come to our courses. So if we undertake a practical-based activity with a, a, de a primary delegate or an LA's practitioner, they take these resources back to their base to do that. Through the partnerships that we have externally, the um, Adina Trust, for example, any school who participates in a professional learning um, activity within CERC are el eligible to apply for a £350 grant. You mentioned earlier on about the Primary Science Teaching Trust. They provide us with a significant amount of money, around about £50,000, to support the development of bespoke CPD within these cluster communities, and some of that is used to, to buy resources to support that bespoke CPD. So, yeah, I, I think... I think it would be great to see that there was a core funding stream to support that practical type of STEM-based activities in the classroom situation, early years um, establishments as well. Do you think the inspection regime should um, value that when we're actually inspecting what's happening in schools? Should that be something that should be interrogated? The lack of resources is acting as a, a detriment to attainment and enjoyment of and, and efficacy in terms of science, then yes, I think it should be. Dr. Petrie? Yeah, I was just nodding. I, com I, completely agree with <laughs> I completely agree with that. And I think there is maybe an issue with our inspectorate if they're not looking at the practical skills and what's actually going on within the classroom and the resources available. Um, and that, to me, actually, that goes across STEM, but it goes across everything. You need to have the resources to, to teach the full curriculum. And if you don't have that, then we have a massive issue. Um, Ms Pirrell, I think you wanted to come in the issue of looked after children. I, sorry, we kind of moved on quickly. <laughs> um, I was just going to um, discuss PEF and say that perhaps um, that PEF could play um, a role in that. I know, um, Lorna, at your school, um, you're using PEF for um, STEM. I don't know whether you wanted yeah. to kind of talk about that, but I just 
um, it's the sustainability of PEF and is it going to keep keep yeah. going? Um, so coming back, I'll answer that point. Coming back to that, absolutely. You know, if, um, as teachers, we want you know our life to be made easy. So if opening a box that's got all the kit to teach a science lesson is takes two minutes, whereas raking about in the cupboards for three hours in your non-class contact time, trying to find a, a petri dish, then absolutely let's get um, let's get as many kits as we can. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, in our school, we've kind of PEF, sorry, um, STEM has been on our school improvement plan. So some of that, that PEF has been used to, I was partly PEF funded this year um, to drive some of the initiatives within school. We've also been lucky that we've been able to use some of that that money for actually resources that we feel are um, can be used sustainably. So we've managed to to get resources in, and these are resources because that's part of the thing with PEF. It needs to be sustainable that um, these resources um, can be used, you know, for for practical mm -hmm. kind of whether it's computing science or you know things like Lego, Connects, Kapla, all these kind of things. Um, but we're very aware that you know that funding. It's not an it's not a bottomless pot, um, so we are very fortunate in our school that we have excellent access to Wi-Fi and um, and things like that. So we're able to to do a lot. Um, and coming back to um, Professor Yelly's point about um, we want the practical science, we don't want everything on the internet. I absolutely agree with that. However having the access to the internet will support things like, for example, teaching the children coding on netbooks, yeah, that kind of yeah. thing. So, um, you know, that's where um, the resources are a problem. I know I spoke, to, I went down to my nursery yesterday and spoke to them about um, this idea about computing science and ICT. And they said, well, we've got one smart board and a couple of B-bots and that's it. Um, you know, and there's so many opportunities out there for, um, you know, developing those computational skills you know these are skills that are transferable you know it's not just um, in a science context you know I did a lot of research and really value the engineering habits of mind and we're trying to push that through our school so you've got things like systems thinking improving and um, problem finding creative problem solving adapting these are all skills that are not exclusive to engineering they're skills that are exclusive to to life really um, so yeah, I think the concern is, you know, how do we how do we fund all these things? Because yes, we need the if we're doing all the training, there's nothing worse. As you said, I've been on courses where oh, that's brilliant, oh that's excellent. You come back to school and go, oh, well we can't do that because we don't have this and we don't have that and we don't have this. You know, and sometimes I'll give it. I'll I'll go to the shop and at my own pocket I'll buy things, but you know I can't fund resources for a whole class, like my own money. Or a whole school. Or a whole school, absolutely. Yeah. Dr. Pete, say that actually. Mm -hmm. A lot of our teachers are buying resources. Um, and that came out really at the Trick Ditch Fest thing. Lots of people said, Well, oh, I bought the B bot for the nursery because they didn't have one. And I think that's appalling that, that, that our teachers are paying out of their own pocket for things for classes. The other point I was going to make is this is not just an objection of funding once, because the very nature of science and especially technology is it goes out of date very quickly. And I think a number of our schools have seen that. They bought, for example, 20 laptops three years ago, and they're already, you know, they don't battery life left, they're beginning to die, um, and they're concerned about how they're going to replace these. So I think we've got to be aware of the fact that this has got to be a continuous funding stream, because these things just change so quickly, and we want to keep up. We want to make sure that they're getting the best resources, and they're actually learning the latest technology, not the one from five years ago. Just, just before we move on in the area of resources, um, uh, and it's um, uh, something CERC have published on, it, it's about the role of technicians. And in rural school, technicians work with primary cluster programmes and things. Are, although it's mainly for secondary schools, have, have, are we seeing an impact on what's happening with school technicians on the ability to do practical work? To primary practitioners we would be best to say, but I think if you're if you're looking to undertake STEM-based practical activities in the classroom situation, then who's going to set that up? It 
would have to be the primary school teacher. And when do they do that? They have to do that when they've got non-teaching time. How much non-teaching time do you have? Not very much. So I think there are, yeah. there, are, there are issues. Certainly there are major issues in relation to um, secondary school education. Um, perhaps not as acute within the primary sector, but I'm happy to be proven wrong. Yeah. Would you... Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I think... Um, I've certainly no experience of a technician coming into my school to, to set up things. I mean, that would be wonderful. It's like some kind of fairy that's going to come, you know. It's the same as when you've got a gym lesson. You know, you've got to get the stuff out of the cupboard before you've got the kids. So break time or, you know, um, that's always quite a useful time to set up a science experiment. But then if you're working on 50-minute periods and you're not starting until 10 to 12 and the previous teacher's in, you know, then when do you set it up? So if you're lucky... You might ask your pupil support assistant, but if you only have a pupil support assistant for 50 minutes in a week, then you know that that that's a struggle. So actually, um, just having more hands to to do that, sometimes you have to rely on them. Um, you know, the maybe sometimes older children to go and and get the things out for the young, particularly the younger children. But um, yeah, I've certainly not seen um, any presence of technicians in in my experience in primary. We're going to move on to uh, the issue of gender. Um, just before I do that, can I put on record the apologies of um, uh, Mr MacDonald, who's had to leave this morning. Apologies to the panel. Uh, and I'll bring in Ms Mackay. Thank you, convener. Yeah, I'd like to return to the, the subject we touched on briefly on sort of gender um, equality or inequality. Um, last week, one of our witnesses, Elizabeth Kelly, suggested the, the extent to which gender neutrality features as a theme in training of early years practitioners is mixed and dependent on who is delivering the training. So I wanted to ask, um, you know, what, how much focus do you think um, the, the training has on that? And then also, once in place, say, an early years manager, is it, depending on their attitude, how successful is that going to be? Is it down a lot to you know, personal um, attitude and determination to, to deliver uh, gender neutral training? So unfortunately, I think at the moment the answer is yes, it does depend on that. Um, uh, and that's why I come back to my point. I think we have to look at the curriculum as a whole and make sure it is gender neutral. Um, we're aware that, uh, that uh, biases can creep into children at a very early, very young age um, and the, the press has been full of those examples so we're not short of examples um, what we are short of is I, I believe um, a concerted effort to change the culture to, to make it not acceptable um, to have a curriculum that I'm not saying um, that anybody deliberately set out to make the curriculum biased. I don't believe that for a moment. Do I believe it's there? Yes, I do. Um, and uh, I think what uh, brought it home is, is, is for me is when you talk about uh, you know, s certain s subject areas, that the bias is in there. Um, and the bias shouldn't be there. Um, and it should be called out wherever it's found because it's not doing anybody any favours to put that bias. I mean, in the absence of um, KPIs in the yeah. STEM, you know, how, how can it be measured? And should that be another aspect of, of the school inspection that, you know, they should pick, be picking up on that? To, so, to yes, but them? I think the school inspection can come further down the line. Actually, what I would do is was I would just pull experts in right from the word go. I would just pull them in now and say, look at our curriculum. Is this delivering what we want it to deliver or is it not? And now those experts could, be, could bring them in from outside Scotland if you want, or you could bring in just very well-qualified and well-versed teachers to look at it because they're just as able as anybody else to recognise um, where the problems lie, but they have to be given that explicit instruction to do that because there's no point in just talking around it. That isn't going to help. We need, I believe, we need intervention and we need some strong intervention and I think it has to go from the early career all the way through. It has to be, um, it has to be all joined up. There's no point in looking at it 
uh, in the um, nursery provision, for example, and then hoping that it's okay in primary. That, that won't work. The follow-up question was, you know, how do we keep it continuing? As, as supposing that it has a, a really good presence and grounding in early years, but then, you know, go into primary and the, you know, the time pressures on the curriculum, etc. It kind of drops off. And also, you know, given the fact that gender stereotype happens very much in the home in, in, in the early years, is that always going to be a kind of battle then? In that sense, you know, if if if, if the children are being being taught one thing and yet in the home, and I, and I, I don't really expect you to, to know how to tackle that, but it's a wider issue, I guess. It, of course it's a wider issue. Yeah. I mean, it's a societal issue. Yeah. Um, and I think society needs to wake up to that. I think society needs to take ownership of it and say it's not acceptable. And, and so if we go to the Me Too campaign, um, whether you, I mean, do I like all of it? No, I don't like all of it. Do I think it's, what, what I do like is it's made, it's highlighted and it's made it acceptable to talk about it. And so I think we have to make it acceptable, or, or, or rather we have to make it not acceptable that there's any bias in the curriculum at all for, for our young people, because we're not doing anybody any favours with that. So I do, do I think, how do I think that has to be delivered? I think there has to be strong leadership shown. Um, and I think we have to um, s step up to the plate and say this is not acceptable in Scotland um, and this is what we're going to do about it. And I think Scottish Government, to be perfectly honest with you, has to take the lead here. Because if, you, if Scottish Government don't take the lead, then um, it's going to be much slower, however else we do it. And I want it to be delivered quickly. Uh, I'm going to bring in uh, Ms Biddle and Ms Heath, and then I'll come back to you, Ms McGregor. Um, I think, um, answering your point, I think self-evaluation within schools, I think gender bias should be possibly looked at more carefully. I, I don't see it as, as part of kind of self-evaluation within schools as such, and I think it would be um, a really useful tool that schools could use to look at gender bias and talk to children and parents about um, why they maybe play with certain toys or go to certain clubs and kind of look at that and really look at how they can address those barriers and kind of address that with, um, with parents. For, for example, I take my daughter to um, a young engineers club once a week. She's three years old. She's the only girl that goes out of a group of maybe seven or eight. Um, it's all kind of older boys and she does just as well as them because she's three and she's interested in building and she doesn't see it as this is for boys, this is... Um, so th that's just from my experience as a parent. Um, but actually, we could be looking um, at early year settings in primary schools and seeing what are we giving these children, what messages are we giving them, what messages are parents giving them, and evaluating that and looking at how we can build on it. Ms. He? just wanted to pick on the point. I think, um, as was in the report, and we have... Um, been working alongside the in, uh, Improving Gender Bias team are doing an incredible, yeah. incredibly good amount of work. We were one of the pilot schools, our nursery oh, right. was one of the pilot nurseries, um, and that's kind of fed into our schools. So, um, you know, from what they've expanded, the government's given more money, they've expanded that team, and that can only be a positive thing. So I think um, really their work needs to kind of disseminate amongst everyone. But I mean, certainly within our school, we've you know, two, three years ago when we asked the children, I think I said this last time, what, what's an engineer? It was Bob the Builder with a hard hat. Now we're getting much more diverse, you know, diverse um, people, you know, aeronautical engineers and, you know, the, you know, female engineers, all sorts. So I think, um, that, and that's certainly because of that work that the Improving Gender Bias team did with our, with our school and how it perhaps changed our, our attitudes, maybe some of the language that we're using. So, um, Anything that can be done to improve what, what, what they are doing, I think, is, is hugely beneficial. Ms Perrill, do you want to come back? Um, I think you touched upon the point of the media, um, and I'm just thinking on the back of what Lorna said about the media portraying um, the one of the lead scientists that discovered the black hole was a um, female. So is there a role then for the media to be putting more information out there about gender stereotypes, that it's not all scientists, engineers are not all male, not all fe you know, female. There's a whole range of um, people in different roles that are 
different genders and kind of breaking that down, but the media playing a part in that. Mr McGregor. Thanks. Touching on, on the point that Lorna made about you know, the Education Scotland have now recruited an equalities team. Each member of the equalities team is linked to our RIC, so I think there's an, again, putting my positive hat on, there's an opportunity there <laughs> for us moving forward to make sure that, that equalities Equalities provision, and by equalities, I don't just mean gender. I, I think we've focused a lot on gender, but we've talked about um, cared for children as well. That has to be part of part of the national picture as well. And, and I agree with what Leslie said. I think it needs to to come from the top. I, I think we ask our early years practitioners and our, our primary school teachers to do enough. And when you look at what their professional learning priorities are for, for the next academic year, the top thing is pedagogies and teaching approaches to deliver STEM learning effectively, skills progression in STEM subjects, and then to use STEM as a raise attainment in literacy and numeracy. Improving quality and equity is number 12 on the list of, list of 17. Their priorities are, are sitting elsewhere at the moment, rightly or wrongly, and therefore having that top level intervention may be the, the way in which we try to tackle up that particular situation. Okay. Uh, Dr. Petrie, I'll oh, quick. I know we spent a while on this. I think we've also got to really look at the role of parents and carers and the general society as well. I think grandparents also have quite a large role here from my own personal experiences. I'm a big fan of the Let Toys Be Toys campaign, and I think that's done actually a lot of good work throughout the UK. Um, I don't know if people are aware of the campaign, but it's basically saying, let's not gender toys and asking toy shops, shops and providers to not gender anything, including clothes, toys, so forth. And I think the Scottish Government actually could get behind that campaign and actually change the way that our retailers work in Scotland, and that could have quite, that could have some impact with parents and carers. Okay. Uh, yes, Ms Mackay. Yes. Just a really, it's a generic question to, to Dr Petrie. When my son was at school, um, it's just about computing subjects. When my son was at school, it generally was the boys who took up computing. Can you tell me how that's levelling out? Hopefully it has. has no, done. it hasn't really. No. <laughs> um, Not really? It's, got, it's going backwards. It's going really? backwards on high schools. Um, oh. Primary schools, I think there's hope. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll be the there's hope there. That because computing science is now part of the curriculum for excellence, and it has been for about five years now for the, the broad general education, we are seeing far more um, younger people getting really engaged with computing science, being really excited about it. So my general hope is that when those people get to high school, we will begin to see a change. But at the moment, it's actually going backwards, and it's gone backwards across the last three years. There's actually less girls taking National 5 higher and advanced higher yeah. computing science. And, and there is that issue about what happens if you are undertaking lots of digital skills in your, your primary mm -hmm. schooling and then you move into secondary school and there isn't a computing science department. And increasingly, that's what's happening as well. So another issue. So, yeah, that, that's, that's a big issue, actually, because they, if you're a high school and you're collecting in, say, 20 primary school feeder schools, which is not that unusual a situation, especially in more rural Scotland, you can often have one or two primary schools who've been very digitally focused, done a lot of work in that area. They've got people going into high school really enthusiastically, and actually the primary school teachers come back to me and say, I had lots of students who wanted to study STEM, and they're now bored because they're doing what we did in primary six in high school. So it's a real challenge for, for high schools. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, Ms Lamont, did you want to come back? Yeah, that, no, that was you, covered. That issue it was covered earlier. Um, I think that, that concludes um, the questions from the committee this morning. Um, uh, can I thank all the panellists for, for coming in? It's, it's been really helpful and we really appreciate um, uh, your contributions to the inquiry. Yes, Ms Hay? Mm -hmm. wanted to um, add, a, there was a just reading the papers and there was a, a, a question that was suggested that, that, that might be asked that I um, the, it was around did we think there was a point in um, if we want this interdisciplinary learning approach in actually training teachers to almost kind of be specialists in one partic you know, particular area um, and my feeling on that was that yes we should still be doing that because if you want the interdisciplinary learning approach um, 
if a teacher's not confident in a STEM aspect of that, then so just a couple of anecdotal things that I think might help. Um, I'm doing a primary engineer um, car challenge with my class at the minute. And just to name off some of the interdisciplinary learning, so we've got maths in there because they're measuring the wood before they cut it. They're working to a budget to buy the resources. Um, it's also social studies because they're talking about the sustainability of electric vehicles. Um, it's science, it's forces, it's electricity, it's literacy, it's reporting on their progress. Um, I'm also reading a book, um, Boy That Harnessed the Wind, about um, William Kakwamba in, I don't know if you're familiar, he, he built a windmill in Malawi. Um, and he spoke a little bit about finding out about um, how electromagnetism worked in motors and he was fascinated by it. So to deepen the understanding, because I had the confidence, I was able to take a sidestep and this week we were wrapping wire around nails to see how we could get paper clips to stick to a magnet. Now, a teacher who doesn't have that same level of confidence wouldn't have taken that, that perhaps sidestep um, to deepen that understanding. So um, while an interdisciplinary approach is great, I still think that teachers still perhaps need the CPD and the training to then be able to make those cross-curricular links. <laughs> Um, just before we wind up, we mentioned industry and we know there are some programmes out there like the Barefoot programme that are encouraging people. There's, a, there's other clubs that are funded by industry. Um, this, this week we're having a debate tomorrow. Um, many of the species champions will be involved from the Scottish Parliament. I, I am species champion for the Pearl Bordered Flotillery and I know the Butterfly Trust have some um, projects and they work um, mainly down in England um, with schools there. Have either of our practitioners come across um, charities and, and things like that, SPB or other organisations that aren't necessarily industry, that, but are they supporting schools? Um, I've had RSBP, uh, yeah, PB, have come into schools before to kind of talk to children. So I've, I've seen that. I haven't had much experience of kind of other charities that have been willing to come in and, and do work with children. I mean, we've had like workshops from people like the, like bee buddies who you know come in and do work so i mean that that was fantastic and um, wild planet explorers have been in as well and um, we've done a lot of work um although um obviously it's we're, we're paying for these services and um, bright green hydrogen came in and did a lot of workshops so um they are there but i think we were having this conversation um Again, coming back to this, um, this equity that the reason why these people came into school was because Laura and I are really driven at seeking out these opportunities. Mm -hmm. And other schools, if you don't have somebody who's maybe got that same kind of passion, then maybe these opportunities will, will pass these by. You know, these, these organisations do publicise themselves, but in an inbox that comes in with all these things, you know, I've had colleagues say, oh, I just deleted that. You know, because that's that's the reality. The focus is on perhaps something else. So I'll come back to my spiral again. Just yeah. Again. I concur with that. Um, and I was looking at the the young workforce and trying to get people in from the arts to come and um, talk to our children about their jobs. And the emails I got back were, we don't have funding, we don't have the time. Um, so sort of charities. I think we had one person that was able to come from youth theatre arts. She but she has dedicated funding in order to do that, so. I would just say there's a STEM ambassador network in Scotland. Um, it's something like 2,600 ambassadors who give up their time to support um, education in the community in Scotland and a superb source for you to yeah, make contact with. We had um, 17 engineers so, uh, re that we'd sourced from the STEM ambassador network come into school um, and um, yeah, I think that needs to be tapped into because from their point of view, actually getting an email from me saying, well, you come into school means that they're able to meet their CPD requirements for that year. So absolutely, that's a fantastic resource. Right, yeah. I'm to come in specifically on the Barefoot Computing Resource. So I'm about to speak slightly against the BCS who I'm here representing, which is maybe not good, but I'll just be honest. And say so that resource was primarily developed for the English curriculum, first and foremost. Um, it is used a lot in Scot Scottish schools. I know um, Education Scotland promote it. I think it's got some great stuff in it. It really does. But it might not fit your classroom pedagogy or your classroom's resources. 
because it was developed for a, a different place. There are lots of really good resources out there. And what I'd rather see is us mapping the intended learning outcomes to a wide variety of resources and then actually allowing the school teachers to choose what fits their curricula, what fits their interdisciplinarity as well, because Barefoot is very computing and based computing driven. And there's some great resources like the, I'm a big fan of the Grok Learning Academy, which actually comes from Australia, um, but is far more interdisciplinary. So for example, there's a, a great primary school resource where you actually try and diagnose the, 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 the cat that's got a green nose. Um, and you work through programming to try and find out why this cat has got a green nose and what's happened to this cat. And it teaches some, some things about biology and things as well. So it's a really interesting way of working. So I would say all these resources are great. It's great we have them, but one thing doesn't fit all and shouldn't fit all. Can, okay. I, can I just echo that I think uh, a lot of the learned societies, not only um, the, the computing society, um, of course, they tend to be UK-based, um, and uh, whereas many of them try to tailor what they do for Scotland, um, it's not always there, but, but I do think the Learned Societies, as well as charities, have a huge part to play, and do try and play their part. Um, but to make it sustainable, um, requires resource, in my opinion, at the school, at the individual school level. That is what is needed to uh, help take it forward because all these uh, charities and learner societies can help enormously, but if there is no buy-in at the school level through lack of resource, then it won't continue. And yeah. that's where, that's very sad. Okay. I, I'm going to... Um, bring things to a close then. So thank you once again for your attendance this morning. I'm going to um, uh, shortly go into private session, but we will be having a further evidence session at our next meeting on the 26th of June. So um, uh, on that basis, we'll suspend. That's awesome.